Well, it uh, certainly gives me <laughs> great pleasure to open this session. Uh, my name is Lee Tsai. I am a professor in the education and psychology department here at UCLA. Um, I'm also the faculty director of Prest, part of my course voice. I've been <laughs> fighting over this uh, minor case of respiratory infection, but I was cleared by my doctor to come here, so I'll be meeting with a group <laughs> of people. I don't want to give my germs to them. It's good to share certain things, but, but not germs. Um, so I'm, I'm clear to do that. Um, so Crest, as you know, is, um, is a research center at UCLA. Uh, I've been involved with Crest work for the last six years. Um, Crest by itself, it existed as a um, as center for study of evaluation, center for study of evaluation, and as the National Center for Research on Evaluation Standards and Student Testing, for over five decades on UCLA campus. Um, founded by uh, Professor Eva Baker, our good colleague and friend, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Um, it is a singular existence because it combines a lot of educational assessment with evaluation, with evaluation methodology, with psychometrics, <coughs> educational technology, um, as well as a whole range of uh, industries where we work in, education primarily, but also the medical fields, uh, engineering, uh, military-related work in, in terms of training and personnel, <coughs> so on and so forth. And um, more recently, we've also been working with the lively educational te technology sector um, that is starting up in Los Angeles. Um, so today's session has the title, What is the Evidence <coughs> Do After Schools Programs Make a Difference for Kids? And I am an educational statistician by training. So what do an educational statistician uh, think of this, uh, this general topic? I was posed this question during the preparation phase. Uh, well, I have always been supremely interested in complex evaluation studies. For evaluation studies, the simple goal would be something that's very simple for statisticians to do is to see if there is a difference. You know, is there a, an effect, so to speak, on certain outcomes of interest? But to understand the process of how we get to that effect, whether it's on academic achievement or so on social development uh, or on this general notion of how kids develop resiliency for at-risk kids, um, it requires that we unpack the process through which the intervention or the programs work. And complex um, multi-site programs such as the ones that we're talking about here today, they really offer some of the greatest uh, data advantages for educational statisticians. But that's not why we're here. We're here to talk about the programs themselves, their importance, particularly in this, um, in this time when uh, um, sometimes the that there are discussions where their, their uh, very existence are threatened by, is threatened by the cut in funding. Um, but I think that it is particularly important for us to realize that there is very solid evidence behind these programs, um, certainly um, from our past work, but uh, looking into the future, there may be long-term impact studies, long-term <coughs> uh, evaluations that one can look at and this is uh, one of uh, our interests at UCLA, that is to use evidence, to gather evidence uh, in support of decision making, in support of implementation, in support of improvement. So thank you very much for your time. And uh, uh, let me just uh, uh, spend one minute to, to thank uh, one of our, our staff here, Deborah Hefford, who put this together, as well as the How Kids Learn Foundation in terms of their support. And, um, um, my role, uh, as, as with yours, is, uh, is basically finished here at this point. I will now <laughs> switch to that of a listener. But before I do that, let me introduce our friend and partner, Mr. Eric Garner, who is the president and CEO of LA's Best and a long-term supporter of our work. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Eric. Thanks, Lee. Thank you. Um, good morning. So I, I want to start off by talking about sure. how this came to be. And Lee hinted at it very diplomatically and politely. I'm going to say it a little less diplomatically and politely. Um, several months ago, um, this blowhard from the Trump administration came out <laughs> and said that we want to zero out funding for after school programs as well as things like Meals on Wheels because there's no evidence that these programs um, create any outcomes or have any success. 
And um, I happened to be in my office when I got this news. And in my office, there's a bookshelf. And on the lower right corner of the bookshelf is a stack of reports about this big from UCLA's Crest Center, um, which are all full of evidence of the outcomes of after school programs over the last almost 30 years of LA's best being in existence. So this um, was a little bit frustrating um, for those of us in the field. Um, but of course, we can't just sit around being frustrated and call people blowhards. Mm -hmm. I was contemplating, I decided on the, the more polite word. So I went with blowhard. <laughs> um, and we need to do something about it. Because if um, we haven't made it clear enough to the general public um, and to those in positions of authority that our programs um, have evidence of success, then we need to talk about it. Um, and we maybe need to look at um, finding new evidence as well. And so um, Deborah and I um, have been talking over the last several months about how Crest and LA's Best could, could shed light on this area, on this issue. And um, I'm super excited that my two top choices, the first two people that I called, both said yes um, to be on this panel. And so uh, it's my pleasure to, to introduce them now. Um, Dr. Pedro Nogueira um, is a, a professor here, distinguished professor of education here at the Graduate School of Education and Information <laughs> Studies at UCLA. I don't want to leave out distinguished. I don't want you to feel like, you know, <laughs> not just a professor, a distinguished professor. Um, he's a sociologist who focuses on the ways in which schools are influenced by social and economic conditions. I first met Pedro several years ago when he was at NYU um, and was really a leader in bridging the, the academic and research world and the youth development world in New York, where we both were at that time, um, and nationally, and continues to be a leader in that field. Um, the, there's not too many um, public intellectuals <laughs> these days, I feel like, um, who are really speaking truth to power. And um, you will, after, if you haven't already heard him, now that you've met him, you will um, notice that he's you know, prominent on CNN, MSNBC, all these, you know, the, the biggest media outlets in the world. Um, but also really focusing on um, young people, um, schools, and youth development programs on an ongoing basis um, here in Los Angeles and nationally. Um, previous uh, to his um, higher education career, he was also a teacher in two cities that are very close to my heart, Providence, Rhode Island, and Oakland, California. I grew up in, in Oakland and lived in Providence not too long ago. Um, and those are two cities that um, have a lot of need and have a lot of talent and, and, and assets that are unrecognized. So um, you know, I admire Pedro for having done that work. Um, I'm not going to go into the, the over 200 articles <laughs> and books, um, the many, many, many honorary degrees and awards. Um, but to su suffice it to say, there, there are too numerous to name. And we're really um, grateful and honored to, ha to have Pedro with us today. Um, and then the, the other person, I was going to say the second person, but you weren't, the, I don't remember who I called first. Okay? I might have called you first. I don't no, remember. you called Pedro first. No, I might have called him first. Because I would have called him first. <laughs> well, maybe I called Pedro so I could get you, you know. Um, so I called, I called Renata and said, come on, Pedro's doing it. You got to do it too. No, I don't remember. But um, Renata Simrel is the president and CEO of the LA84 Foundation, um, which is a national leader in, um, in, you know, advocating for and support, directly supporting um, sports, youth sports um, as youth development and education. Um, and prior to that, um, she has served as a senior vice president and chief of staff to the publisher of the Los Angeles Times, um, a senior vice president with the LA Dodgers, um, over a decade in real estate development and was deputy mayor for economic development and housing. Um, and in deputy to um, then Los Angeles City Councilman Mark Ridley Thomas. So Renata brings a deep, deep understanding and experience of how all this plays out here in Los Angeles specifically, um, and a broad understanding of where, where these questions lie in the context of the larger socio-political cultural conversation. Um, it's always important to note when introducing Renata that she also began her career in the US Army as a military police officer <laughs> in the US and Germany. I just feel like that's like, you know, yeah. <laughs> yes, sir, you better it's, stay in line. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm saying, yeah. Um, she also currently serves on the boards of United Way of Greater Los Angeles, the LA 2028 Olympic Bid Committee. Congratulations, all, right. to all of us. Um, Los Angeles Sports and Entertainment Commission and the Los Angeles Dodgers Foundation. So again, very grateful and honored to have both Renata and Pedro. And last but not least, I want to introduce our, our moderator for today. Um, 
Uh, Ju Julia Felon is, did I say your last name right? Felon? Felon. Felon, okay. Felon sorry. good. When Not I said felon, felon, it felon. Right, yeah, no. Not yet. Um, anyway. Although we might need Julia, them for that. Exactly. Felon. Right. Felon good, man. Is a, <laughs> that's how I can remember it. That's right. Um, is a senior research scientist here at UCLA's Crest Center. Um, she has extensive experience and expertise in the design and management of large-scale projects focused on kindergarten through higher education, educational assessment, and standards. Um, and brings real expertise in what it means on the ground to actually evaluate these outcomes. As Lee said, this can be, get very, very complex. Um, we're not looking at simple <coughs> inputs and outputs, but we're looking at a really dynamic, um, complex array of inputs, and likewise, a dynamic, complex array of out outputs and outcomes. Um, her recent work has integrated common core state standards in both math and, math and literacy into multiple types of assessment, format, and strategies. So um, Julia really brings the, the evaluation expertise to frame this conversation about you know, how, do we, how do we know if we're successful? What's the evidence that programs like LA's Best and, and many of the other after school and youth development programs um, represented here in the room um, actually produce positive outcomes for young people, families, and communities? So without further ado, Julia. Thank you, Eric. Um, Renata had a good idea that since we're quite a small group that maybe we could do a quick, really quick little uh, sort of pass around to say like who you are and where you're from. Can we do that? And we'll start over here. Good morning everyone. My name is Camille Green. I work for the California Council on Economic Education. I'm the Great. Assistant Director of Programs and Development. Great. Are we all sit? You don't have to stand. You can sit. We're, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, Trojans. <laughs> <laughs> Careful, Renata. Actually, no, I'm, I'm, I'm all up in it. I'm still learning to learn. And uh, my work um, in the STEM outreach program. Good morning, my name is Reed Keeler. I'm with uh, World Trip for Kids. We're an expanded learning program here in Los Angeles. Good morning, everyone. Amber Martinez, Incoming Media Development for LSF. <coughs> cool. I'm setting. Hello, okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Holy Kasmin with LA Unified School District, Beyond the Bell, and I work with both the after school programs. Cool. Hi, everyone. Uh, Daniel Monterroso, learning facilitator with uh, LA's Best. Hi, I'm Melissa Fisher. I am currently at AmeriCorps Vista, serving with LA's Best in staff development. Hello, I'm Christine Posada from LA's Best, um, AARP uh, Literacy Project Coordinator. How about we go back uh, right here? Yeah. Hi, good morning. I'm Jennifer. Welcome. I'm Noelle Griffin, I'm Senior Associate Director at CREST. Good morning, my name is Alvin Hansen, Director of Institutional Giving with LA's Best. Uh, Greg Shaw, CREST, uh, Associate Director of Technology Research and Innovation. Sorry, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> so, our colleagues are here at UCLA at the Engineering Research Center for Educational Opportunities and then for Mobile Education. Which, um, so previously I graduated from UCLA Yay. a few years ago <laughs> with a, a doctorate in education. Great. So I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, good morning. I'm Sharon Spetter. I also work at LA's Best doing our communications and our partnerships. Um, I 
Kate Fox, I'm with Hairspring and a board of trustees of the Next Generation School called the Inaugur School and with the Fox Family Foundation that provides grants to um, organizations that are encouraging kids to thrive who <coughs> have uh, suffering from either mental or physical impacts. Uh, Carlos Santini, um, friend of LA Fest, UCLA alum, and national vice president of the programs for our school. Oh, great. Terrific. Thank you guys, thank you very much. So we have a great spread of folks here. So we're gonna start off um, Pedro and Renato, I guess we should have decided who was gonna go first, but um, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna let Renata go first since you, you were called first maybe, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but uh, Renata and Pedro are just gonna give a few uh, opening comments and then we're just gonna sort of open up, we'll, we'll have a discussion up here and then uh, you know about sort of 30 or 40 minutes before the end we'll kind of open it up to questions from, from you guys. And just again, we wanna have a, have a dialogue with you. We wanna engage you guys with whatever things you're thinking about in terms of how do we figure out what's working and how we communicate that, right, in, um, in after school programs. So Renato, do you wanna, if you wanna just give a few, a few opening comments? Sure, just by a show in. of hands, how many people know the 84 Foundation and what we do? Well, beyond the bill doesn't count. And LA's best doesn't count. So I'd take it that very few um, who aren't in that category do. So we were, uh, we're the legacy of the 84 Olympic Games. There was a surplus, and a portion of that surplus came to the organization to fund youth sports. Uh, and youth sports 33 years ago, um, school-based sports 33 years ago, was vastly different than it was today. And um, the board initially thought they were going to spend down that money and fund uh, sticks and balls and infrastructure throughout Southern California. They didn't really know what they were going to do. And over the last 33 year period of time, uh, we've chosen to, well back in the day, invest those funds into the market to create an endowment um, that still uh, preserves, that is a, the most significant legacy of youth sports of the Olympic movement uh, in the history of the Olympics. Um, we have now an endowment of about $160 million and we have about six to seven million dollars that we invest back in the Southern California community. And while our origins started as a youth sports organization with the legacy sort of at the core of our value, the Olympic values, I should say, uh, we're really a youth development organization using sport as a hook. Uh, I took over the organization uh, about two years ago. Um, Anita de France, who stewarded the organization for 28 years, uh, retired to help bring the Olympics back to Los Angeles. And as I started to look at uh, our work over the last 33 years, it became evident to me that's what we were. Um, we're using sport as the hook to engage. And where we're finding the best impact, um, and, and let me back up and say that the, what we put out front to the market was, you know, we serve 3 million kids, we supported 2,200 organizations, we've trained 80,000 coaches, uh, you know, we've invested 230 million back into the market. And while that is all great and impactful, uh, to me, uh, a young middle school um, person who was a little, you know, lost as a middle schooler, 12 and 13, found sports as a vehicle to engage, uh, found sports as a, as a tool to become <coughs> life ready, um, that I said that there is much more meaning in terms of what we do uh, and felt that we punched under our weight class. And so as I started to look through where we're making the best uh, investments and the best impact, um, it was in school-based sports programs, particularly after school. And I see LA's, um, not LA's best, but Beyond the Bell is here. Um, there's national statistics that show that youth sports participation begins to decline at 12 and 13. It's no surprise that's middle school. Uh, when I went to school, there was PE that we had five days a week. Uh, I played basketball in the middle school in our basketball team. Um, that no longer exists. Um, states mandate on the most uh, uh, aggressive scenario, two days a week physical education, most or some even one day a week, and recess is almost non-existent. And when you think about the cognizant abilities, uh, the learnings that kids get through sport, um, be it at the early childhood level, the high end art coordination, uh, learning to deal with conf conflict, building confidence, um, it's, it should be a no-brainer that our uh, school districts, our state policymakers, should be investing in sports, but the contrary has happened. They've de-invested de in sport. Uh, and focus more in an academic setting, which is not an either or, it's an and. And we've started to amplify the work that we've done with Beyond the Bell um, nine years ago, started an after school, uh, middle school sports program in all 94 middle schools. Um, there's four core sports, three supplemental sports, and about three years ago, the organization started to track the impact of that program. 
Now, what we believe is that a positive coach, mentor, safe environment, you know, really yields the best out of kids. The competition element that you get out of sports um, yields those benefits that we are going to talk about today. And we looked at um, a couple of um, uh, seasonal uh, statistics, causal maybe. We haven't gotten deep into the, you know, the, the genuine cause and effect, and I'll get to that in a moment. We looked at uh, transition from Spanish uh, instruction to English language learning, and we found the kids in our sports program transition to English language learning at a faster rate. Uh, eighth grade uh, algebra rates, our kids were performing much better than the school as a whole. Uh, and then the socio-emotional or sort of grit, the confidence, um, we found um, had a higher rate than, say, compared to the rest of the school. And so, you know, we're digging very deep into that and seeing what our role can be vis-a-vis uh, -vis the next 10 years where the focus is going to be on Los Angeles and Southern California market as we look to 2028, is how can our organization be a backbone infrastructure catalyst to bring like-minded organizations, um, be them foundations, be them organizations like Beyond the Bell or LA's Best, uh, be them corporate sponsors like Dick Sporting Goods, who's doing great work in this area, um, like Nike, who's doing great work in this area, like Mattel that I'm learning is doing great work in this area, and see if we can't create a movement. Because at the end of the day, um, as we've learned and we've engaged this three-year longitudinal study to really dig deeper into LA's Best, as it relates to research uh, and information, you know, my background is not philanthropy, it's not academia. Um, it is really about how do you tell a story that's compelling to get people to move. And so how can we use research to get deep enough, but not so deep that it loses people? And how do you tell the stories? And I'm finding the greatest way that we tell the story is through the kids and the parents who are benefiting from these programs. Uh, and I'll share a little bit more about that as we engage that conversation. So I'm um, happy to be here and share this conversation. And hopefully uh, this will be um, the beginning of a, of a great dialogue and uh, the start of a great movement. So <clears throat> good morning. Uh, I want to start by making, I think, um, an important political point, which is there is a fundamental injustice even about asking for evidence. Hmm. Let me explain why. And I'll do that through, by telling a story. I was asked in 2008 to moderate a panel uh, <coughs> that was, uh, it involved Arnie Duncan, who before he was named Secretary of Education, Jeffrey Canada, who many of you know leads the Harlem Children's Zone, and uh, Carl Hayden, who at the time was Chancellor of Schools in New York State. And um, a lot of it was featuring Jeffrey's work and, and the work he was doing basically from birth through college to support children in Central Harlem. And uh, they provide a full range of services, including after school services for young people. And so at one point, I asked Jeffrey the question. I said, uh, Jeffrey, is there any evidence that the programs that you provide uh, benefit the kids you serve? And Jeffrey said, I reject the question. And I said, why do you reject the question? He said, because we never ask that question of affluent kids. Hmm. We give them, we fix their teeth, we give them music, we let them play sports. We do all kinds of things for them, but no one asks, where's the evidence that this will help them? We only ask that question when it comes to poor kids. And I nodded, and I turned to Arnie Duncan. I said, what do you think of that, Arnie? And Arnie thought about it for a moment. He said. I think he's going to need evidence. <laughs> I said, why? He says, well, because if we want to keep the funding growing and if we want to support programs for other kids beyond those in Central Harlem, we'll need evidence. Now, I do want you to think about that. Uh, earlier this morning, Renata was talking about her sons. And I'm sorry to use your sons as an example, but fine. one likes karate, <laughs> one likes sailing. I don't think anybody's done any studies on, on whether or not sailing karate benefits them. I kind of know intuitively that it does, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And that we shouldn't even, it, the question's kind of ridiculous, right? What, what's the impact of sailing on your son? Mm -hmm. Who knows, right? <laughs> um, maybe he'll be a sailor. He said he likes marine life. But the, the point is, when, when it comes to poor kids, so again, building on Renata's question, why does LA Unified limit recess? Why are so few kids in middle school in sports? <clears throat> Do we need evidence to get more kids in sports? Do we need, e we have evidence. Obesity is a huge problem. Number one health issue for young people. Do we need more evidence than that that we need to keep kids active? Um, so to some degree, the questions we ask are absurd, right? 
But I, I admit that we're in a political environment where unless you can make the case to funders and to policymakers that mm -hmm. these kinds of investments are worthwhile and important, then uh, we have a problem. Now, we still have a problem because for policymakers, we actually have to show that if we invest in after school programs for kids, it'll improve test scores or it'll improve graduation rates. And that to me is problematic because suppose, now sometimes I would hope that yes, there will be a link <laughs> that we can make, but suppose the links are really tenuous, right? It's hard to establish a real linear connection between sailing and, or let's pick between um, music and test scores. Does that mean we take away music if we can't show it? <clears throat> or do we say, no, um, some things have an inherent value because when kids feel good about coming to school, they come and they participate more, and, and so therefore the kind of evidence we've got to look for has to go beyond simply impact on test scores and graduation rates. How about well-being and wellness indicators? How about mental health as indicators? of, of uh, impact. So I want to encourage you, particularly those who are really thinking hard about these kinds of investments, to, to not be, first of all, to acknowledge the fundamental inequity of the question. We're not asking that about affluent kids, only poor kids. And second of all, what evidence matters? Um, because I think if we go down the path of looking for impact on test scores, we might find that we actually contribute to further disinvestment in the children. Okay. It's going to be a great conversation. <laughs> I know. Oh, let's get I know. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to get some water while we yes. do it. Okay, yeah, I'll get it for you, Penny. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> when in my conversations with both of you prior to, to coming here, you know, and you've both mentioned it now this morning, you talk about this, you know, equity gap. You know, I think Pedro, you and I talked about how, you know, how do we know that we're serving everyone that we need to be serving, right? That, that if, if there's a target audience, maybe there should or shouldn't be, but if there is, you know, how do we know if, if we're getting all of those folks, right? And so do you see um, ways, tangible ways that uh, engagement in after school, out of school time activities, whatever we want to call it, can can help to close that gap, maybe for kids who aren't perhaps, you know, getting a, as rich of an environment in, you know, in their homes or, or in the school. And, and I mean, I see the whole thing as sort of being a, a circle, right? That, you know, we can influence one aspect of it. But how do you see the equity gap potentially being closed by engagement in these programs? Um, so I'm gonna talk about the equity gap in the context of youth development through sport. But that can mean any enrichment program, so music, STEM, science. Because I think at the end of the day, um, as Pedro said, it's really about engaging students and keeping it fun. Um, so in the context of the equity gap, um, how many people saw the Time Magazine last, year, uh, last month that talked about youth sports? And that it's a $5.1 billion industry. Brian Gumbel's talking about it. Um, and, they, and they featured a couple of families and talked about the travel teams, the club teams, and some families spending upwards to $15,000 a year um, to um, you know, engage their kids in sports. And many chasing that you know, one-tenth of one percent that I'm gonna get a college scholarship. Well, guess what? The kids that we serve, the parents and the families that we serve, good luck if some of them make $15,000 a year as their salary, you know, most, of the families that we serve are $25,000 or, or less. And so when you think about the play equity gap as one example, um, it is huge. In the same way that our um, you know, economic system has the haves and have nots, that is affected uh, with our sports programs as well, or kids' access to sport and play opportunities. And it's, it's essential in terms of, and again, it gets back to my com comment about stories. So very quickly, let me share you a story about a young man, African-American man. Um, grew up in South Central Los Angeles. And by all standards, because of those two things, that the statistical probability that he would either be dead or in prison by the time he was 23. No doubt about it. Father's in prison for murder. 
mother was physically sexually abused. At 11 <clears throat> years old, you know, he's this sort of lost kid with two siblings, and his mom finds this after-school sport football program. And it's not about football, it's about engaging young men with positive coach mentors and giving them opportunities. Took them to Dodger Stadium, helped them with homework, food programs. And like many um, young um, uh, minority kids from urban communities, particularly male, they think that their pathway out of poverty, out of the hood, is football, basketball, the NBA, the NFL. Uh, he played football through college, got scholarships, that was his mean to go to college, but he engaged in this one mentor that says your pathway out of poverty uh, was economics and finance. And so he was intrigued by that, started studying finance. Gets to be a senior at TCU, he's not NFL material or college material, or this would be NFL material, so he's not qualified for the draft. Guess what this young man's backup plan is? Anybody? Finance. What? Finance. He's on his way to Oxford, England as a 2017 Rhodes Scholar. Mm -hmm. And you know, I can go even into the depths of sort of inequity in terms of his dark skin, he's got dreadlocks, and so he's not you know, your prototypical kid from this story that's going to you know, use his mind to actually escape. And he tells me in these conversations, we're not a sport isn't my life, but it helped to save my life because of the engagement that he got. Um, and so I think the inequity is very real when you look at, and I'll just use my, um, my, myself as an example, because I, as parents uh, of uh, two boys who were in LAUSD, one still is, uh, you know, my son uh, loves enrichment classes. He loves to be engaged. And we're in one of the best elementary schools in, LA, in LAUSD's district. Um, he, you know, he has science lab once a week. He has the librarian once a week. But the last four weeks he hasn't gone because she's shared amongst four schools. Um, he has a PE coach for two days a week, and it's two days a week instead of one day a week because the parents fund a nonprofit that helps keep Coach Marty and an assistant coach engaged. This is one of the best elementary schools in LAUSD. Now, a mile away is Oakwood, a private school that costs no less than $34,000 a year. You can, and, and I'm sorry, there's no after school sports program um, to really speak of at a school. YMCA is there, they do some play. I can put my kid in Oakwood for $34,000 a year. He'll get PE five days a week. There's an after school intramural sports team, science lab five days a week. They're doing a partnership with NASA. So when you think about the inequities that exist um, for the vast majority of kids in, urban, in the urban context, it's very real. Um, and we've been trying to focus, I wouldn't say trying, we've been focusing our resources there and I think to the point that Pedro talked about is that there's an, is this an equity in terms of how do you justify the investments that uh, public institutions make in those uh, urban schools, but they're not asking the same question. Uh, and so it's really creating a uh, learning gap, uh, opportunity gap that is very real. And I think we're starting to, we're, we're not starting, but we're starting to see that. Um, I think if you were to correlate um, I think the homeless population, the affordable housing crisis that's, that's preeminent, preeminent in Los Angeles, you know, that has an effect because uh, talent is universal, or universal opportunity is not. And we're seeing that uh, in the work that we do uh, on a daily basis. Yeah, the um, one estimate is that there is about a 6,000 hour learning gap mm -hmm. between affluent kids and poor kids. If you count preschool, after school, summer school. Just shared time um, between, pre, you know, child, child's about three up until um, high school, and and so simply the time involved in learning that that is a disparity that reinforces these gaps in opportunities that Renata just spoke to. Um, at the same time, because a number of people are aware of that, and so there have been calls for lengthening the school day. Uh, which by itself does very little because, as we know, more of a bad thing is never a good thing, right? <laughs> and if the school day itself is not very um, enriched, um, simply lengthening it by 15 minutes, as they actually debated and almost had a strike over in Chicago, is kind of ridiculous <laughs> as, a, as a path to go down. So we're not simply talking about time, although time matters. We're talking about the quality of the time. And this gets us right into the question around evidence, right? What's the quality? What, how do we make sure that, um, and that, that, that the time in after school is high quality and therefore has an impact? And, and the impact, I think we, we you know, it'd be interesting to hear how Crest is looking at impact. 
hopefully is not simply academic, but also developmental as well, which is clearly um, as important. Um, I, I think w th in the debate about preschool, we finally have come to some clarity that it's more than simply putting kids in, that the real impact of preschool is quality, right? And that if you don't ensure that, 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 that children have access to well-trained teachers, a high-quality curriculum, all the supports, then simply putting kids in babysitting doesn't have the same impact. It's almost negligible, right? Uh, and that, and many conservatives use that as an argument against universal <coughs> pre-K, for example. Um, I think the same is true of after school. Um, and one of the things that concerns me is that um, because we don't invest in quality, because many of the people who are running these programs are not trained and are very are paid very low wages, um, therefore, it's how do you get the benefit of a program that is so under-resourced, mm. right? Um, you know, it, it, and, and uh, you know, I'm not sure what the coaches get paid. Not at, a lot. At your son's school, but uh, if you want um, the, the impact, then we have to make the investment. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I want to just point out again, we once did. Right? It was common in this country, for example, for the longest time, for most kindergarten classrooms to have a piano. And for most kindergarten teachers know how to play the piano. <coughs> right. Why? Because kids like music. Mm -hmm. It's a great way to get kids engaged. Well, they still like music, but the pianos are gone. And music is treated as an elective that they may or may not get on a regular basis. Why the disinvestment? We once saw it was important. I used to have PE every day. So. Every day, I did too. Mm -hmm. Why yeah. now twice a week? Um, and so I think we have to also acknowledge that we have a bigger problem that goes beyond evidence. And, and it's a, about a disinvestment in certain children and certain communities. I was thinking about um, Compton. You know, mm. Compton has produced so many, not only star athletes, but stars. You know, the, um, Kendrick Lamar, you can go down the line of, of, of the Don athletes. Dre, and, Leslie and, Sykes. And, 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 and intellectuals who come from Compton. But most people who can will do whatever they can to avoid Compton Public Schools. Because they are, they don't offer a quality education. So we, even when we have the evidence that, that there's talent in a place like Compton, we don't have the investment. And so my challenge, again, as we think about this issue, is that if we don't acknowledge and recognize the, the political environment we've been in, this is not new. This has been going on for many, many years of disinvestment in communities um, and in public resources and in public education, then what we'll end up doing is continuing to fund a program that looks promising for a little while and, and wanting to take nice pictures of and put in a glossy magazine, but not really addressing the bigger problem. Right? The bigger problem is that there's so many kids who still don't have access, and not because the research doesn't show it would make a difference. So I'm wondering, um, you know, we hear a lot of talk about you know social emotional learning and and all these other sort of you know whatever we want to call the non cognitive skills or you know and things that are um, you know hopefully going to make students you know college and career ready. We talk about all these things, deeper learning, and if we think about uh, after school programs or out of school time programs as you know having positive impacts on some of those things, you know. Are there ways that we can kind of integrate that back to your point about the piano is gone and all these other things? Like, how, are, there, are there strategies or things that you're seeing in your work where you can try and kind of bring those back into the classroom so it's not a kind of academic test focused only thing, but we're, we're sort of appreciating all the other things that we, that we know you know, from other areas, not just this, this topic are having positive influences you know, on youth outcomes, right? I mean, how can we bring that into the classroom so it's not a extra thing? Or is that the solution? No, yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of disturbed because you know I've been deep in this for two years and I've tangentially because I have kids and I care mm -hmm. about this and been civically. I don't think that there is a lack of evidence that after school programs, enrichment programs, what we do works. And I wrote down, just to give you some statistics, so um, we talked about mandating PE for one to two days a week. Mm -hmm. But the contrary to that is 48% of LAUSD ninth graders fail the state aerobic test. 
45% are o or overweight and at risk of type 2 diabetes. Um, yet you have then, we're talking about um, graduation rates, <laughs> LAUSD city section did a research product of 35,000 athletes compared to all high school cohorts. Athletes to non-athletes were absent um, almost four days less. Their attendance rate was almost three percentage points higher. Um, and this is the more telling statistic, 92% of student athletes graduate from high school compared to 77% from the district right cohorts. And even if you look at the Beyond the Bell middle school sports program, since we've been studying it and we're in the process of doing a three-year longitudinal study, trying to get a little bit more deep, we've established a theory of change model, is that we girls participate less than any other, um, um, you know, more than male, males. And there was a 163% increase in girls' participation in Beyond the Bell over a five-year period of time. 54% increase in play overall. Kids are, on average, 77% um, of the kids are participating in sport four days a week, an hour, or 45 minutes a day. And so when you think about the research, the evidence, there, didn't you say earlier you have a stack this? Mm -hmm. I've got a stack of unread research that I get preparing for our summit. The evidence is there. If I was to say, you know, what we need to do more of is, I call it white noise. That technology has allowed us to connect and to communicate in ways that we never thought were imaginable. My son's phone is on the fritz and it's like, you know, I'm panicking because there's not a pay phone he can go to or somewhere where I can communicate mm -hmm. with him and that's how we communicate. And that they're all well-intentioned individuals. So what you're talking about, Pedro, in terms of you know the after-school provider or the community organizer that's doing well-intentioned individuals, but we're all talking about the individual things that we're looking to do and all the great work that we're looking to do, that it seems to fall on deaf ears. And I do agree with you. There is a systematic um, you know, process that's been built into the system that um, disinvests in urban communities, um, either intentionally or subconsciously that keeps us at a disadvantage. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us in this room and the networks beyond to say, how can we communicate the evidence that we know works? I got 15 books on my desk at home, sparked, um, mind, growth mindset. I mean, I can go through the list of them. Is there. So how do we use more of a marketing technique? How do we use more of a social media technique? Um, you know, not to put a, a, a cheap plug for our summit, um, you know, but we're mindful of how do we give the policymakers and the funders the spinach and the broccoli that we know that works, that's the data, the research, but also frame it in a milkshake and a hamburger that they're going to want to consume so that they actually hear it. And so you'll see at our summit, Allison Felix, Carrie Walsh, Byron Davis, you know, we're trying to engage these folks that have, and I'm looking at, how many Twitter followers do you have? What's your social media context? How do we market it? I don't know if you saw the um, last week's um, sports section, you know, the ad promoting our summit says with a young African-American kid holding a football and this sort of ominous looking ad, PE is a social justice issue. There is a play equity gap and you wanna figure out how to fix it? Come and work with us and let's see if we can't create this coalition. So, you know, I reject the notion that there's not evidence out there. I think there's an overabundance of evidence how do we gr gather that evidence, g gather a movement, and market it in a way that people will start to hear it um, in an effective way? So just to respond to that uh, before, um, so you know, when we, when we talked a couple weeks ago, you talked a lot about this sort of idea of collaboration. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, is that, is that an important component that's missing here? Is, is that, that the, 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 there are too many sort of disparate type of groups that aren't kind of collaborating both in maybe their efforts and their communication of, you know, what's working or, or, or what benefits they see? Because, I mean, yeah. if, if people are, if the notion is, is that there isn't evidence or no one's proving something, then whether or not the evidence is or isn't there right. is, that's not the issue, right? It's like we we need to, like you say, like put it out there in a, in a digestible form. But maybe that collaboration has to come first. Yeah, yeah, and I'd, I'd be interested in Pedro's perspective. And just to use a, a, a story. I don't know where, where this is going to get well meaning and well intentioned. So yesterday I had a conversation with the Rams, and there's sort of a side project that I have that's not you know core to what we do at the foundation. But both my sons um, 
sailing and karate may be a sport, but <laughs> not the sport that I think that they should play. Uh, but they're big science nuts. And so when I worked at the Dodgers, they really, you know, they were more impressed that I was on the science center board than um, that I worked at the Dodgers. And so we created this thing called Mathletics that talked about the mass and statistics of baseball. We used it with the community of schools to engage kids both from our brand perspective to get them to come to the games and be Dodger fans, but also to link sport and STEM education. And so fast forward, um, you know, at the foundation, and we're talking with Jeff Rudolph, the space shuttle's gonna leave, there's 10,000 square feet, and I said, this is a great opportunity, we're the sport capital of the world. Let's create a science and sport exhibit. And it can be a 10,000 square foot exhibit, and it really engages kids in the, you know, conditioning, um, uh, physics, you know, you kind of get the idea. And so I'm having this conversation with, uh, with the Rams about where we can collaborate. And it's about $6 million to, for a three year period of time to put this project on. That's not a lot of money when you think about the billions and billions and billions of dollars that these sports teams make. Uh, and the billions and billion dollars in, in wealthy individuals that are here in Los Angeles. And San Francisco has used their facility as a sort of STEM education and invest about a million dollars a year in doing great work. And so as I'm having the conversation with the Rams about coming in to collaborate with us on this piece, what they're trying to figure out, because they're ultimately a business, is, well, why can't we do that, a STEM facility, the science of football, mm -hmm. at our facility? Because then we can ultimately bring the kids to, the, um, to our facility. We're you know, imprinting them, Rams fans, collateral mm -hmm. parents, what have you. And so I said, I get that. I work for the Dodgers. I get that. I said, but does it have to be an either or? either or. Can you have a, because there's 450,000 Irving kids that come to the Science Center every day during school. Jeff Rudolph has done a phenomenal job. So you've got a built-in environment where the kids in the context of where they live are benefiting from this. So can you create sort of networks? And so we're engaging that conversation, but I use that example to say is yes, people talk about collaboration, but it's often a small C with me at the forefront. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to do is to get a big collaboration where it's a big C and it's a we at the forefront. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the question is about social and emotional impact? Yeah, and, and, and if, we, if we accept that those, that we can, that those things have have a positive impact, right, on youth, and then how can we figure out how to bring some of that back into the, the classroom so we're not thinking about, okay, today we're doing, you know, math and that's all about our state test versus, you know, some of these other motivation, perseverance, grit, you know, all these different things that they don't, that, that these things aren't seen as, or, or maybe even not considered at all, right, but that, that other ways that we can bring that back in so it's a sort of a, you know we have this sort of holistic picture and we're not you know, if we know that that's what we need to get kids to be ultimately college and career ready it's not just about passing a test that there's a whole host of other things yeah right? that's a good question and an important question um Milbury McLaughlin a, a former professor at, at Stanford um, did some study on after school programs several years ago and she, was, she looked at the um, impact on the social mm -hmm. and the emotional learning that occurs in these programs. And, and one of the findings was about um, the importance of mentorship and the connections, the adult mm -hmm. youth connections that occur there. And one of the things we know um, in education, in educational and school settings, is relationships are vital to impacting academic outcomes. Stu many students are relational learners. They work for teachers they like, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, less likely to work for teachers they don't like mm -hmm. or who don't like them. Um, and we know that when you look at the way race and class and language and culture impact that relationship, that the disconnect often exacerbates some of the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the difficulty in creating strong, positive relationships that then impact academic outcomes. So part of what we need to figure out is how, does, how do we make sure that what we are learning from the very best after school programs is in fact influencing what's going on right. in the school day. The disconnect there is pretty wide and yeah. it'd be interesting to hear from yeah. the folks in the district about how you try to bridge that <coughs> gap because I would say um, there's such a narrow focus on the achievement um, issue that's dominated the, the both policy and the overall discourse. Mm -hmm. um, we know if, if the superintendent was here, she's gonna get judged 
on graduation rates. And then, and then right. my right. colleagues here at UCLA just came and studied, well, guess what? A lot of the, your graduation rates have gone up. Very few of those kids are graduated from college, right? Exactly. right? right. So, so we, they keep getting hammered on that, mm -hmm. which that makes them say, okay, we need to just focus on A through G, uh, getting, and getting those indicators to move. And what's hard to convince them of is that by being attentive to these other things, that you can, in fact, move that dial. Right. And so um, I think this is you know, where Crest comes in, <laughs> um, in helping to make the case clearer, but not simply to the superintendent and, and uh, her colleagues, but to the legislature. Mm -hmm. right? That is mm -hmm. that, that unless we start, and I think California has started moving there with the new accountability framework to try to broaden it, but I think it needs to be broadened further still, right. so that the impact on those kind of, some, I think, um, inaccurately called the non-cognitive traits, right, no, I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, actually do count, right? Mm -hmm. And that we're able to say, yes, mm -hmm. learning to collaborate is important. Learning to be disciplined and to be on time, all those things right. are really very important to right. success later on. Right. Until that counts in some way, they'll continue to get, I think, shortchanged. Sure. But I think, right. Pedro, to, to, to comment on that specifically, I think it's also equipping the teachers who are engaging the kids in the classroom. And I, I have to say, I'm seeing movement, both as a parent um, who's in, very involved in my school, in my son's schoolwork, but then also talking with other parents throughout the district. I'm also on Austin Butin's LAUSD task force. So we're getting an inside look at you know, those opportunities. And I think you're starting to see um, my son's teacher calls it a brain break. So you know, your, your, their focus <clears throat> is testing. What, what, what matters, what gets measured matters. And right now it's testing that matters. And everything is you know, leading up to, I think, the next test in February, April, whenever it is. And it's a very rigorous schedule given the compressed school day that they don't have time um, or they're having a difficult time finding out how they can do uh, how they can incorporate time to do a, a mind break is what she calls it or you know you might stand up and do some yoga and so I think we're starting to see the evidence of uh, physical movement play uh, the socio-emotional types of uh, opportunities coming back into the classroom um, one example uh, might be um, Liz Wolfson um, who started Girls Athletic Leadership School uh, in Denver and LAUSD uh, started the school it's an all-girls school started in seventh grade I believe um, seventh grade, I believe. Is it seventh grade? Six. Sixth grade. Sixth grade. Um, and it's all about bringing movement, play, athletics back into the school setting. Um, and, you know, very interested to see uh, that first year result of LAUSD in terms of the benefits that it has to all those mm -hmm. things that we're talking about. Right. But I think the challenge there is, I mean, I think you can have these, these you know, special schools or these special programs which are terrific, but it's how does that scale, right? The and some of those habits and things that are that are being infused into those those programs that are really amazing and they're and are showing these great effects. But how can we make that not oh you only get that if you go to this special career focused right. magnet school or whatever it might be? Because I mean then again you've created an inequity situation there too, right? Yeah, I think it's like when you're trying to move a bureaucracy yeah. that you know you've got a we're moving we're moving, and that might take you know years afterwards for it actually to get moved. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, it's it's really staying focused and staying consistent in terms of you know where the data is coming from. So you know I I challenge Chris, what are you studying? I mean, are you studying those examples that say you know here are the local national examples and putting you know th those benefits out in the forefront, and then who's amplifying those in a way, and then to what end? So you know certainly the work that the after school movement did with the ACES funding. Um, you know, that took the better part of two years, and it's going to continue to be a constant battle. So how can there be this collaboration, mm -hmm. you know, from the external sense, mm -hmm. not in the sense of we're talking about in the classroom, sure. you know, to keep focus and to engage, um, you know, those types of conversation with the research, with the kids who are benefiting, with the parents who are benefiting from those opportunities, um, from the actual setting to start to scale those opportunities within the classroom. And I think to a certain degree, as I'm <laughs> in the belly of the beast of LAUSD, you know, it's really what is the autonomy that you're giving to the principals and what is the research and the information that's getting down to the level that's genuinely engaging the kids to be able to make those scale, scalable um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, changes at that level. Mm -hmm. And so for you, Pedro, you know, you've been thinking about this for a long time. You know, for you, like, what are the quality indicators of these programs? If you could pinpoint something or some things. 
Well, I, I alluded to some already. One is yeah. the uh, training mm -hmm. um, right. uh, for the um, personnel, the mm -hmm. staff. Um, and which is tied to their salaries, um, <laughs> right? Because it's hard to right. attract well-skilled people who um, with low wages, right? right? Um, right. And keep them. Um, the other is, I, I think, the quality of the of the program itself. That is, especially you know, what is um, um, you know the. And the, you know, there's so much variety. You know, the variety. There's there's there are sports programs, but there are a lot of academic programs sure. and music programs, and um, and we it, you know so what's what is the program itself in terms of its curriculum or the content? How well thought through is that? Um, we know, for example, there was um, in the early '90s there was a big in response to a lot of the um, youth violence um, big effort to promote what they called at the time midnight basketball, right, which opened up the gyms for safety reasons. Um, and, and it amounted to little more than basically opening up the gym and throwing out a basketball. And then they started to realize, oh, that doesn't do that much, right? You actually have to do more than open mm -hmm. the gym. You have to uh, have some structure and some content. Right. And I would say the same kinds of lessons are true about after school programs. Mm -hmm. that, that is, that if you want kids to participate, especially the kids who we know are at greatest risk, then there's got to be well-trained personnel, there's got to be strong content, there's, and ideally there should be some um, reinforcement between what's happening in the after school and what's happening during right. the school day. Mm -hmm. Some communication between right. the, the providers mm -hmm. um, so that they are talking about the, 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 the young people being served mm -hmm. and how to reinforce and make sure um, that certain needs are being met. Um, we spend so much, I, I was talking to um, folks in LA County about juvenile corrections, and we spend uh, so over $200,000 per juvenile um, in juvenile corrections. Such an inefficient system, sure. um, because, in part because there's so little coordination uh, between um, what's happening in corrections, what happens when they leave, um, they're served by many different agencies who don't communicate with each other, and we end up with a system that's completely broken. Um, and, and so a lot of what we need to, to focus on is both the quality but also the coordination, mm -hmm. and to make sure that there is better delivery of service, more targeted um, uh, emphasis on particular kids that we know. We know statistically kids in foster care they, they are least likely to graduate from high school. Um, if with the right supports, you can change that, those outcomes significantly. Um, and so we can use data to provide, not only um, highlight what does quality look like, but how do we target students that we know need the, uh, these, the, the attention and the supports um, if we're going to change their outcomes. Mm. And other challenges in getting those kids. I mean, I know that when you and I talk, that, that there's this issue of you know you, you're perhaps not reaching everyone, right? right. That that there's you know potentially a, a sort of a fraction of the population who would really benefit from these programs, but you know That's maybe right. they can't get there, or their parents need them to babysit, babysit. for them, or right. whatever it might be. Right? right. So I mean, again, that perhaps speaks to integrating things more into In the school. The, yeah. that, think, that would be how it answer. Yeah, I think that you hit it spot on is, you know, we are the theme for, you know, this year for us is play for all. And so when you think about the notion of how can you get the most kids to play and be engaged in structured play movement and sports? Mm -hmm. Schools. Sure. You sure. have the infrastructure. Sure. It's a relatively safe environment. There's trusting adults and caring adults, and then the, the element that we add is trained coaches. Mm -hmm. And you know, we see when we before we started, you know, there were zero kids participating in sports, and now there's 12,000 on a yearly basis. And you know, really, the limit of being able to replicate that to other school districts because it is a scalable program. Mm -hmm. We know it works. It is a program in a box. We're actually talking to Inglewood um, about expanding it to Inglewood, um, and it's just a, a question of resources to be able to expand that program. But even when you talk about sort of bringing it into the classroom, the challenge becomes, um, you know, the system. And I'm just going to call it the system. Yeah. Um, you know, so we say to LAUSD when I came on, hey, we want to do a three-year longitudinal study. And we really want to get a little bit deeper in terms of specifically the kids who may be having attendance issues, academic issues, 
uh, you know, and we got into this rigmarole about, well, we can't actually track the individual students, so we can okay. give you the data, but we have to disaggregate the data, mm -hmm. and then we've got to spend a ton of money to sort of re-aggregate the data. To, <clears throat> and I'm like, well, every kid, can't we just go to the parents that are in the sports programs and say, hey, you know, can we have your student ID number so we can actually track? Uh -huh. And so the coaches that are engaging the kids, if you're a little, you know, uh, uh, struggling on math, that we can actually work with mm -hmm. you and give that feedback sure. because the coaches, they care about the kids. Yeah. And so we even, um, you know, in, <laughs> buck up against the system of saying if we're truly here, and it's, it's, it's sort of ironic that the new school board, I think their first measure was to say kids first, kids for all, something like that. Kids first? Yeah. Kids first. And then when you have, and we're not asking, we're paying for it. Uh -huh. Beyond the bell, and we're, we're, part, we're paying yeah. for it. There's no additional resources. We're just saying so that we don't have to spend a ton of money with the evaluator. Can we have this data that you already collect? You do the, uh, the yearly survey that gets into the social emotional health of kids. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're doing what we can to sort of break down those systems. And it's, it's the systems. I mean, right. I just, you're going to get me frustrated now in this <laughs> conversation. Well, no, I mean, I always say that the biggest challenge for, for me in my work is, is, is not thinking of an idea or, or a problem to solve. It's actually figuring out how I can find some folks to agree to participate in right. that. In, in, in some of those same challenges. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna let Eric uh, maybe come up and, and um, say, say a few words and then we'll, we'll open it up to the friendly crowd for some uh, questions or comments. So I get the lucky role of being respondent. So <clears throat> what that has done is led me to actually really pay attention and focus <laughs> on what's being said. Um, so I just have a few uh, quick points that I wanna sort of draw out from what I heard. Um, you know, I'm representing the position of a direct service provider, right? So LA's Best is in close to 200 schools, um, serving about 25,000 kids every day. And so we see where the rubber hits the road with, with all this stuff. Um, but the first point that I want to make is actually a sort of broader, more universal one. Um, and, you know, Pedro, you were referring to um, what we value, you know, and that the idea of the pianos in the kindergarten mm -hmm. classrooms that we once did this, and it didn't cost that much money. Having a, a PE teacher, I don't believe, costs more than an, any other teacher. It's not a matter of the, the money so much as it is the priorities and the time, right? Um, and I just want to call out that, for me, from my perspective, this is a, it's a problem of our larger culture mm -hmm. in terms of what we value. Mm -hmm. um, that we, I, I love this, what, the story you told about Jeff Canada rejecting the question and then I think you said, I reject the notion at some point. <laughs> um, I'm going to start rejecting notions and rejecting <laughs> questions. Me because too. one of the, the constructs that, that most of us are sort of buying into right now is this construct of readiness, right? So um, we talk about college and career readiness. We talk about workforce readiness. We talk about kindergarten readiness, which is something that my wife and I are facing directly right now because mm -hmm. our son just started kindergarten. Um, <laughs> How do you know? Or, or they weren't ready for him. Yeah. Uh, that's a better right? way to put it. Yeah. Because uh -huh. I think can, yeah. he's not ready for that track. And that's exactly, I want to ask you to join me. No, I'm just kidding. Because, <laughs> no, no, because I think that's the point is that they have a track that they expect him to be on. And he yeah. went to, to, to preschool. Yep. But he went to a preschool that was Waldorf style preschool, so mm -hmm. there, there wasn't a focus on letters and numbers. Mm -hmm. if, if you were drawn to that, you did that. If you weren't, you didn't. So he comes in, you know, he can count to 12. Beyond that, he starts, keep, keeps counting, but it's not in sequence. <laughs> um, he does sort of know a few letters, but not really. Um, and so, I mean, he's five years old, so he goes to kindergarten. It's like, you know, Saturday Night Live says, you know, we don't, go on, we don't start the show because we're ready. We start because it's 1130, mm -hmm. right? So he's five, so he's going to kindergarten. Um, but he's not ready. Um, and if he had been in one of LAUSD's um, early ed centers, he would be ready because they would have drilled into him the letters and the numbers. Maybe. He might hate school Maybe. already, though. Maybe. Yeah, right. <laughs> but he might hate school already. <laughs> and so this idea of, of readiness, um, you know, I, I actually think that we need to question it because it's a form of social control. This, mm -hmm. is, what, this is my thinking on this. It's a form of social control. Because the idea of college and career readiness is that our kids are successful when they have a, a, a job that we have in mind for them. It may not be specific, but it's a professional job making a certain yeah. salary. So if, if we want our kids to grow up to become universal thinkers, 
or to have a creative practice that they can that sustains them through their life or to um, with the idea that their mission in life is to help others or contribute to their community that is subversive in, 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 in contrast to this idea that it should be kindergarten readiness, it should be high school readiness, it should be college or career readiness, and, and forward. Our, our, our daughter went to a public school in New York that was not a, in a wealthy um, community. And I went to the kindergarten orientation. And I was there with all the other parents, there for kindergarten orientation, and the principal was up talking about what they were going to experience in kindergarten, how important it was for them to succeed in kindergarten so that they could succeed in the rest of their elementary school career because it was a, they were preparing them to have good jobs. And I'm sitting there, the, the, the father of a five-year-old, <laughs> right? I'm not, I'm not worried about her having a good job. And I know that my sister, when she went to her orientation for her children's school, private school in a wealthier community, that th that principal was not talking about. The, those kids getting good jobs. Because that's a given, mm. for one thing. And also because the system isn't oriented towards that. The system is oriented towards helping them develop a love of learning and orienting themselves as learners in the world and helpers in the world and developing the social skills they need to be successful uh, and, and have successful relationships. So I think that we as a, as a community need to question this notion of readiness. We need to question it with, our, with those who fund our programs. We need to question it within our programs and take the developmental approach that, that, that Pedro was, mm -hmm. was describing. Um, secondly, this gets to the practical part. Um, you know, even if we reject the question of providing evidence, as direct service providers, we accept the circumstance that in order to be successful getting funding, we need to have evidence to, to show private and public funders. And much more importantly to me, we need to have the, the evidence to get public funders to expand the pool of funding. Mm -hmm. Because it's not enough to just, for us to be the ones that, you know, we beat each other, we compete with each other for funding and we win. That doesn't make me happy. What makes me happy is when we grow the pie. You know, and, and when we're, and that means not just applying for funding, but that means going to elected officials and getting them to, to prioritize this in the budget, right? Because the budget is a statement of values and priorities, right? And so we know we need that evidence, <clears throat> but we also don't have the capacity to develop that evidence. We barely have the capacity to provide a quality program. And so in order to ha have the capacity to find and cultivate the evidence, we need private and public funders to fund that, that work. And so, you know, hats off to LA84 for engaging with Beyond the Bell in, as, a, as a thought partner and not just a grantee. Mm -hmm. and, and same with LA's Best, but in terms of the longitudinal study that, that mm -hmm. you're doing, that's sort mm -hmm. of rare. Um, you know, my colleague Robin is over there, you know, director of institutional giving at LA's Best, looking for foundations to fund an evaluation. There's like two, and that's like the whole country, who would fund the kind of evaluation that we need in a program like LA's Best. And that has to shift if we're going to be able to engage with partners like Crest to, to gather this evidence. Um, and the last, the last thing that I, that I want to end on is not a problem, because <laughs> um, I don't want to end on a problem. I want to say that I think the pendulum is actually swinging very yep. much in our direction. Yep. Um, in after school and youth development, we've been talking about social emotional learning for decades. We didn't necessarily call it that. Right. Uh, we might have called it character development. We might have called it values. We might have called it conflict resolution. We might have peer media. I mean, there's so many different names, but it, we're, we've all been focusing on the same things for so long. And now, even when the conversation is framed by test scores, um, th there's a broader thinking to what might have led to that increase in test scores. You might have heard just yesterday um, that the, the state test scores for California came out, right? And on NPR, the story was about the, the increase, the growth in test scores was, eh, it, I mean, it was, they said it was, in, you know, not substantial. It was really not even, I don't think, significant. It was a percentage point or two. Mm -hmm. But the story that they did to illustrate the one school in Boyle Heights that had some of the greatest growth, Hollenbeck Middle School, it was a surprise to everyone that this Hollenbeck Middle School in, middle, in, in Boyle Heights was one of the LAUSD schools that had the greatest growth from last year to this year. And when they look into why, of course, they don't know, right? Really, when it comes down to it, they don't know. But if they ask the teachers and the principals, what do you think you're doing that's better? They, they said, we're, we're doing experiential learning. We're doing collaborative learning, where our teachers are serving as guides so that the kids are engaged and can lead their own learning 
and that they feel motivated to work with each other to do this. And the teacher said, I didn't know at first, you know, we changed, the, the, the rows are set up like this in the past and now they're set up in, in groups and I'm not lecturing anymore. I'm, I'm going around to the group sort of, you know, helping these, it sounds like after school, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and the principal and the teacher, they say, we didn't buy some fancy curriculum from Pearson or anyone else, you know, in the educational publishing mafia. Um, <laughs> we, we, didn't, we didn't bring in technology, you know, that was special, that helped us. We didn't just do test prep. We did authentic, meaningful, collaborative learning, and lo and behold, actually these test scores improved. So for me, what that is, is it's, it's a reflection of maybe they made the tests better. Maybe the tests are actually starting to be a little bit better at measuring authentic learning. Um, but what was really exciting to me about that story was that the story's focus was not on the, the test scores. The story's focus was on the how, the process, and that that process was much more where we as a field already are. Um, and so there's a little bit of the, maybe the tail wagging the dog or maybe people just got so fed up with you know, kids being boiled down to just grades and numbers and scores and the billionaire boys club leading the way even though they don't necessarily know anything about education, they're deciding education policy. And so the pendulum swung back to, oh, maybe we should listen to the educators. Yeah. Right? Maybe we should listen to the researchers. So that's my response. Can, Thank you. And yeah. now I'm gonna join the yeah. panel. Can I, can I respond to that for a quick second? Um, Shit, I just lost my train of thought. Um, what did you just? A uh, bunch of stuff. Um, the test it was swinging in our direction. So There's, thank you. Yeah. Um, so you know, what my I don't, I don't even know where to get this out is there is so much we can talk about the impact of after school, social emotional learning, health, academic achievement. You know, you can go on and on and on. And my perspective is that we are not spoon feeding today's environment, our audiences, in the right way, um, that information that actually uh, focuses on change. And I think that you hit it right on the head in terms of um, you know, the policy makers. So there's various audiences. There's the teachers, there's the administrators, there's the policy makers, there's the funders. And each one of those communicate, see, and in interpret the information differently. Mm -hmm. And I think that as, as I look at sort of the academic um, you know, research or the findings, that it's done in sort of this um, a la carte sort of buffet type of environment and I think that we need to serve it up more as a five course menu. So what are the five things that we know that work? So if experiential learning and bringing the, you know, the, the learnings from the after school, if it's health, if it's uh, you know, whatever those five things are, that I think it's incumbent upon us going back to my theory of collaboration, how do we create a movement and collaborate those five things? And it's not to say that you're not going to talk about the other 15 things that you're doing great in the impact. But I think if we talk about those five things and then figure out how we communicate to that to our various audience and the way they receive them, I think that would be more effective. And I think that part of what you guys are doing is in that it may not be intentional, but when you think about the ACES funding, it was a very specific target. What was fed up to them in terms of information was very specific. The coalition that was built around that effectuated change. So how can we do that? In a, in, a, in a more collaborative way around those five or four things that are most impactful to try to get mindsets and system changes. All right, I think that goes to sort of this definitional issue like you mentioned um, in your first comment about readiness, right? And to me, when I hear you say that, I think, well, I don't even know, like, what do you mean by that, right? What does it mean to say that someone is kindergarten ready or college and career ready? Like, we have to know what that really means, right, and, and how, only, only if we can really truly define, okay, well, we, we, we would imagine that someone who's college and career ready has these types of skills or, or is, is competent in these areas uh, that aren't just the academic stuff, right, the other things, that if you can define that, then it becomes a more sort of, you know, potentially measurable kind of outcome. But if you are just using the word readiness and it, I don't know, like, what's ready to you and me is a different thing. So but, I think that did you measure to the you measure to the least common denominator. So the LUSD would say sure. that re that, that sure. definition of readiness is A to G. Sure. And then if right. you graduate right. with the A to G to requirements, right. then you should be ready to go to college. But right. to Pedro's point earlier, of the seventy five percent graduation rate, twenty six percent of those that graduate are actually graduating from college. Right. So if you look at what you need to succeed in society, right. I'd 
reject that notion that A to G requirements isn't a definition of readiness. No, so, I so, agree. So right. how do we change right. that system to right. define a more measurable, more effective, more impactful notion of readiness? But also okay, the, the questioning, what, ready for what? Right? <laughs> sure. Because right. Sure. When I was in kindergarten, yeah, I, right. wasn't, I didn't have to learn to read in kindergarten. Right. right. Like, I, I believe I learned to read in first and second grade. Uh -huh. right. right. And so, and right. kids are not, nothing happened in terms of evolution. The kids are now somehow developmentally advanced, uh -huh. right? Right. So the work that they're being asked to do is developmentally inappropriate. Right. So it's especially hard for them. Yes. So we're, but, so, even the, the idea of if you meet all the indicators of readiness, let's say for kindergarten, that's not necessarily a positive thing. If right. you don't buy the notion that kindergarten should, you know, kids should be able to read by the time they're done with kindergarten or, right. or, or whatever. And then you don't, you don't see the unintended consequences. And I'm personally dealing with the kindergarten reading thing. So my son was just recently diagnosed with convergence insufficiency. You know, who knows? Does anybody know what this is? Does anybody know what this is? Okay, and it's been around since the 1990s. And so he struggled in first grade with his basic math facts. You know, so it's, he'll look at the board and he can't actually take what's on the board and write it down on his paper. And so we're thinking, but he's just got this verbal IQ that he's, he's, he's a smart kid. So it's like, I know he's not, he can keep. So finally we go through this whole process and he's got convergence and sufficiency, which means his eyes don't converge in the way that you need to converge to translate and to process what you're learning in math and sort of shapes. And it, it, it affects his reading comprehension, it affects his basic math facts, and he has to struggle extra hard because it's like he's on a horse and carriage and he's got two thoroughbreds that are fighting in opposite directions and he has to fight his eyes to go together. So I'm learning all this stuff and I'm like, what causes it? And his doctor, his educational therapist says, it's this advancement of reading and the whole notion of being out in recess or playing and you know, just doing those things that we used to do when we were kids has actually caused him not to develop that system. So he's got the, the, har the hardware is working, but the system, he's operating on a, you know, a, a Microsoft system that's 10 years old mm -hmm. because he hasn't developed that system. And so he's got to actually do eye therapy. And guess what his eye therapy is? hand-eye coordination, the shit he's supposed to learn in what kids in five grade, fifth grade learn. Right. And it's like, now, and I'm gonna just, it's $2,000 per, ses or per uh, session to get him to have this therapy. It's $100 an hour for his educational therapist. And so where I immediately go to is there are, how many other families are impacted by this? Right. Who don't even know? Or, they yeah, don't right, know, don't right. get diagnosed. Right. The teachers don't know. I had to mm -hmm. send his teacher the literature on what it was. So how many are not get, getting diagnosed in their impatience, their um, you know, lack of performance? You know, they grow up thinking that they're stupid and the teachers think that they're you know, not disciplined. Mm -hmm. And you know, the light bulb came on with him where he says, huh, I'm not dumb. See, mommy, I told you I was tired when I was like, because you know, you're mm -hmm. struggling. And so, you know, I think that that term, uh, yeah. that readiness is, we, we have a lot of work to do, people. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of work to do. All right, let's have some questions or comments from our um, audience. Yes, right over here. So let me let me answer that because um, in the early 90s I was on a task force that was created by the Centers for Disease Control, focused on youth violence, and out of our work there was a major breakthrough. 
And that was to define violence as a health issue, hmm. not merely as a criminal justice issue. What that, and that was under the first Bush. And, and what was significant about that is it opened up other resources and other ways of responding to what that time was very high rates of juvenile homicide. So I think you're onto something. That is how you define a problem triggers how you respond to the problem. Right? If we say that we have a health crisis on our hands that we need to address because we know that graduation mm -hmm. rates are linked to better health outcomes, then maybe some of the resources that we have in healthcare can also be applied to address issues of youth development in schools. And, um, so, but I, I think that that is broadening the conversation right, about these issues is absolutely critical. And that's the reason why I say that when we look at, at, at after school programs, we do need to look at developmental issues, not simply you know, the academic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. First of all, thank you. I feel like I've done a church. This yeah. <laughs> it's, it's very, very powerful. I mean, this is going to be required viewing for, for my staff. Just a, a, a question around evidence. I remember during the early portion of the ACES expansion, there were a few funders who really focused on the fundamental expansion and offering of after school. Just Mott, Packard, those folks were involved in really setting the tone as ACES grantees expanded. And their focus is really around staff development, youth development, really providing foundational programming. Since then, in the few in the 15 plus years I've been with this movement, that's fragmented now, where those folks are not necessarily funding the foundational components of after school, but that's been replaced by companies and foundations funding activities. Okay. <clears throat> Can you speak to the effect that that has had on being able to provide this common five metrics or measures of evidence of success, has that, has that been affected by this, by this kind of fragmentation of funding and focus on after school? Just, just your thoughts on that. Huge. Um, I mean, this is one of the problems, and, and this is where I'll be very critical of philanthropy, right? Philanthropy is very fickle. Right? Um, and so at one moment. Present company excluded. <laughs> well, you guys at least stick them with sports. Right, right? exactly. <laughs> but you know, they'll say, oh, you know, we're after school, it's big. And then a few years later, say, we're not doing after school anymore. Yeah. We're on to, um, you know, infant mortality. And, and you know, infant mortality is important too. But guess what? After school is still important, right? And, but it's hard to maintain, even when we have impact, maintaining continuity. Uh, is extremely difficult because priorities change. I, you know, I, this is the world I live in all the time where I'm trying to talk to foundations and I'm seeing shifting priorities before they solve the problem they said it was important to them yeah. a few years ago. Uh -huh. And so, um, you know, I'm very worried. We got a lot of money for after school from 21st century learning grants. Um, what's going to happen with that <laughs> in this administration and this political environment? Um, not because the need's not there, but because the political winds have shifted again. Um, and so, you know, I think that's one of the messages I often send to my colleagues in the universities and who do research, is to always remember research, you know, we don't, as important as evaluation is, that's not necessarily a guarantee that something will continue to be supported because so much of this is political. Yeah. Um, we did um, a conference a few years ago looking at, um, programs that have a, a, an impact of young men of color, particularly, at, at, at both improving educational outcomes, reducing um, uh, incarceration rates, improving health outcomes, and employment outcomes. We had model programs, we had researchers, and we had, had policymakers in the room. But what we didn't have, and it was, I was thinking, wow, this is great, and then at one point I realized, oh, I'm missing this completely. These things are political. It's not about policy. We don't have any elected officials in here, <laughs> right? And, and they ultimately, if they don't prioritize it, it doesn't happen. And so that's, I, you know, it's sad, but it doesn't mean we don't do the research, but we just have to always keep in mind, you know, <laughs> I think academics like to think that, 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 that policymakers, uh, politicians, I should say, think logically about policy. Mm. As we've seen with this healthcare debate, Evidence has nothing, it's all about you ideology. Logic. You said logical. <laughs> it's about ideology, it's about political expediency, it's about 
That's right. what it's about, Cruelty. not about right. ethics right. necessarily. <laughs> I, I think my perspective is absolutely that it's caused, caused an issue, but I think that it's a, um, it, it's, a, it's a combination of factors. I think one uh, is sort of globalization. So if you were to look at philanthropy in Los Angeles 30 years ago, there was more focus on you know, the region, the state. It was very sort of narrow thinking. And now, and you can even look at that both in philanthropy and corporate giving. I mean, 30 years ago, you didn't have corporate CSRs. Um, and, you know, as we talk to corporate CSR organizations, you know, they're looking at scale. They're looking at impact. And so, you know, even as a regional funder that's doing incredible work, the conversations that we have with other philanthropy and other corporate social responsibility are like, ah, well, you know, you're regional. I know you get Santa Barbara to San Diego County, but we're really looking national and even international. And part of that is the marketing and the benefits that these corporations and these f foundations get in terms of the impact that they're that they're making that ultimately drives in additional resources or brand or whatever the thing is that they're chasing. So that's number one. Um, I think number two is on the flip side that we haven't kept pace with the change in narrative. So right now what's hot is social equity. Everybody's talking about social equity. So Weingart is one example. Weingart Foundation funds a lot of sports. And I'm having conversation with the chair of the Weingart board and you know we're just friends having conversation, having lunch, and we've changed our narrative because people think, oh, L84 Foundation is a youth sports organization, and I'm like, no, we're not. We're not. We're not the you know 5.1 billion dollar industry that's you know trying to get kids to do lacrosse and be on these club teams. We are a youth development organization using sport as our mode of engagement, and that we have. Then um, sports helps from a health perspective in terms of kids playing and moving from a socio-emotional health perspective, and we didn't even get into the conversation because we probably need five more hours, about the stress and the trauma that these urban kids are under mm -hmm. that makes it difficult for them to perform. And in large measure, particularly Latino and African-American boys, is the only way to engage them is through sports. And that you also have the academic benefits that the research and the evidence is out there. And so just as our one example, is that when I would have conversations with Nike or Dick Sporting Goods or whomever, they're like, ah, oh, you just fund you sports, we, you know, we do that. Uh, and I'm like, no, uh, California Endowment, we're having a great conversation with Bob Ross now. If you want to actually get health indicators to, to move the needle, guess what? Maybe you should think about collaborations or funding a program that we have that impacts that. Um, same on the academics and conversations with Annenberg. So that's number two. Um, number three, I think that there is this cultural phenomenon, this societal problem that we're not talking about that we're valuing the wrong thing. We're valuing, um, you know, I mean, I don't want to put it in a sports context, but the NFL is a billion dollar industry. You know, the Super Bowl 50 raised $15 million. It's a billion dollar industry. $15 million, you know, as part of their legacy to invest back into the San Francisco community. Billion dollar industry over a week, and you raise $15 million. And that you don't think about, well, how do we create sustaining funding um, by, say, perhaps doing what LA84 does and invent that in endowment? That 15 million, you know, 5% of that, if you're getting 8% in the market, is going to generate about $750,000 a year. That's meaningful to LA's best. That's meaningful to be on the bill. That's meaningful to these organizations that don't have them. And so I think, um, you know, I don't know how to change that piece in terms of how we value the right things. Um, but I think those are some of the issues. And then I'd finally close on saying that the need for, we, we did this, um, had this presentation by um, John Cabara at the California Community Foundation. And you know, I was trying to give the context of LA84 as a philanthropist and where our market has changed over the last 33 years. And that what you see is this growth of nonprofit organizations and this decline of philanthropic giving. Uh, we're a great exporter of philanthropy in Southern California, notwithstanding the wealth that's here, say, compared to New York. Um, and so you have this growth of nonprofits and need, and you've had a decline of philanthropic dollars uh, and investment that just, you know, we're, we're having, we're, we're chasing, I mean, we, we invest eight, six million dollars a year in the Southern California market. You know, we could use 10 times that amount, you know, just to expand and scale the impact. So, um, yes, it's ha ha definitely, um, you know, has caused an issue. Yeah, in the back. Well, first off, thank you. Um, you were talking about the five course meal that I think we've had about today. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it's done things in my pockets right now. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, you were, you were talking earlier about rejecting. It's something, as you've been talking now, I have a master's degree in education, and my father is, let's say, the opposite of me politically. And there was a time once where 
in my program, we, we had some, some data that talked about the importance of classroom size. And it blew my mind once that I was home and my dad was trying to argue with me. He shows me this book, shows me the exact same data and proved to me the exact opposite of what my <laughs> school had been. So I think sometimes when we look at evidence, you know, I reject the fact that there is objective data at all. That's, that's my personal <laughs> I don't think anything is objective. But my question, because you talked about story, and that's really something that lights my fire. Because I find that so often the change in my life and the change that I have with kids and the change that I have with people working with kids comes out of story. But my question is, and maybe there's no answer, but, but what are your thoughts on what are the impactful places and people to have these stories with? Or do we just, you know, because social media spreads things, you know, even lies very quickly. <laughs> you know, so I just want your thoughts on what do you think would be the expedient ways to which, are, which might be the most impactful, or is there an answer to that question? Where we share our story? My, my answer is everywhere. <laughs> and that there's no way that's expedient. Um, because we have, to, we have to broaden the conversation so we can start <laughs> to move the culture. Yeah, we, we want you know, to be ready. So what's that? I said readiness again. We want to be ready. <laughs> well, we well I, I really think that uh, if, we, if we're only having these conversations amongst ourselves, yeah. um, that it's, it, it doesn't move us, right? And so that's why I'm, I'm so grateful to everyone in the room because we actually have a pretty, a fairly diverse mix of, of institutional representation here, you know? And it could be a lot more diverse um, and, and, and maybe the next one will be. Um, but oftentimes these gatherings are, are, you know, folks who are, you know, preaching to the converted or however you want to put it. Um, but I think we need to be having these conversations in a much, much broader way and we need to not shy away from the aspects that we need, to, we need to change as a society and not just what the teachers need to do different or what the hospitals need to do different or what the, you know, this sector or philanthropy needs to do different because we're, we're, we're all just running in place when we're, when, we're, when we're looking at it in such a segmented way. I think it's a combination of how and who. Yeah. And I'll use, and I think how, who, and what. Um, and I would encourage you know, many of you in this room who are engaged in this work um, to really focus on a social media expert and a marketing expert. We didn't have a communications department at LA for when you talk about preaching to the converted. So we had this summit to talk about 30 years of great work that we've done and we're, when I came on we had four of them and we were moving to the fifth. And so our fourth summit was held at our campus. It's beautiful, don't get me wrong. And it was 75 people that were in attendance. And as I looked at the attendance list, it was the people who already bought into what we were talking about. It was your grantees. Yeah. It was, for, for the most part, yeah. the USOC grantees. And so I said to the staff, I said, well, if we are a thought leader and, and want to move the envelope, shouldn't we be talking to you know, people who need to hear the message? And they said, well, what are we going to do about that? I said, we're going to ha have the, uh, the summit off campus. Off campus? Well, how many people do you want? I said, I don't know, 400. And they said, well, who do you want? I want policymakers. I want sports teams and brands. I want, you know, I want anybody who cares about the youth that we serve, that buy into what we're selling, to hear the message. And so that's number one. And so we did that last year. We sold out two weeks in advance. And the feedback that we got when we did the, um, the, the survey was people said, I was in the youth sports business. I was in the youth development business for years. And I really had some great takeaway value. And we did that by not just sharing our story, so for me, everything that we've learned, the 30 years of research that we have, I will give that away to you for free. Now, we'll ask corporate sponsors to help you know, sponsor this summit because it's a $300,000 investment, which is big for me because that's $300,000 less that I'm putting into the marketplace. And we're amplifying, Beth, we're focused, so I, I, I don't reject, but I would counter to say we, we're focused on what is that one piece, one takeaway that we want the audience to take away and focus on. And we focus on that for a year. And this year, it's play for all. And we're saying school-based uh, sport after-school programs work. And here are the national and international examples that we're going to serve up to you, both spinach and broccoli and hamburgers and shakes. So Allison Felix, Allison, you're going to talk about the impact of school-based sports after-school programs. Carrie Walsh, this is what you're going to talk about. Baron Davis. And so when I look at their social media, Tweet it out. That's, I'm authoring an op-ed piece uh, rejecting the notion that youth sports is created equal. 
and Baron Davis has a bigger following than I am. Five people might listen to what I have to say. Five million people might listen to what he has to say. So I think it's a combination of the who, the what, the where, and the when. And we didn't have a marketing uh, communications team on LA84 for 28 years. Our grants and program team, I'm not disparaging them, they were the one that puts, our, puts out our, our, our press releases and what we're doing. We now have a communication team, and I hired a 27-year-old to handle social media to get our message out. So just amplify that a little bit about audience. Some audiences are moved by the story. Yep. Some audiences want to see bottom line impact, right? And you need to be able to do both, right? That is, you can't just rely on one. Um, I might think about the impact in healthcare again, convincing you know employers, for example, to invest in in gym memberships for their employees right. comes from seeing, hey, it actually impact people are at work more, out on leave less. Um, so, so it depends on who your audience is. That's the kind of evidence mm -hmm. you need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. evaluation is an overemphasis and overinterest on perhaps the least interesting in our mind and maybe least meaningful part of this, which is well what is the impact on the standardized test scores? And I guess when we're talking about a dialogue and expanding and, and, and trying to disseminate this information, I wanted your thoughts on how we can perhaps change those views or engage in more of a dialogue about what really is meaningful about these programs. Because in a way the overemphasis on the standardized test scores dampens uh, what you can say about the impact and the quality of these programs because it's sort of this uh, far down the line impact uh, if you're going to see it and the ability to really make significant impact on standardized test scores for any individual program is not particularly um, So anyway, what are your thoughts on, on how that part of the dialogue you think Ways that we could affect change there. I think it, it's, when I talk to Dr. Bob Ross at the endowment about collaboration and partnership, I talk about the health outcomes that we're getting through our after school programs and sports, right? Um, if I talk about moving the needle uh, in terms of academic achievement, so I, I mentioned our summit, we're having a dinner with some, like, you know, sort of the salon dinner to sort of move things. I'm inviting Holly Mitchell, Senator Holly Mitchell. Why am I inviting Senator Holly Mitchell? Anybody know? Because she sits, she sits on the budget committee at the state. So if I can educate and inform her that she cares about foster, you know, so I know what she cares about, um, that I know she's about you know, equality and equity and opportunity. So, and, and I, you know, given having worked for an elected official, knowing how busy she is, I'm going to serve up the information, the outcomes, to try to create some connections of what she cares about. So the hope is, and it's, it's, and again, I, I hearken back on marketing and social media because that's the world we live in today. So you've got to figure out a way, what is your strategy to move the person that you're talking to? And so what is your outcome? What are you trying to achieve? And then what are the pieces that you need to put into place? And so the one conversation, the dinner, you know, that we might have with, with Holly, Senator Mitchell, uh, might not move the needle today, but my hope is she'll start to think about it. And then Eric and I are great collaborators. So Eric is going to share the exact same thing, maybe in his, you know, from his vantage point. Um, you know, hey, we might have a conversation with Ryan from Dick Sporting Goods. It might have occasion, you know, to talk to her staff member. So you start to create multiple ways that you start to move the needle. Um, but I think you said it earlier. I mean, it's the consistency and, and staying focused on what is your end outcome and trying to, you know. Um, um, you know, be permeable, uh, not permeable to the, because things move and I get and appreciate that nonprofits, when you're chasing funding, it's hard for you to be consistent on what the outcome is because you're trying to make payroll, you're trying to impact the kids. And so, and this is where we come in as a, as a philanthropist and I see in the foundation world that it's starting to change a little bit. I don't see LA's Best or Beyond the Bell as a grantee. I see them as partners in a movement that is trying to change mindsets and systems. And so 
you know, be on the bill. We started the conversation about how do we carve this piece of a puzzle to actually do a three-year longitudinal study. You know, we're paying for that. They're paying for a portion of it, you know, partners that we bring in. So I'm really looking at our nonprofits as partners so that we're amplifying that, um, you know, uh, five-course meal as opposed to a buffet where people can pick and choose. Let me say something. I know it's going to sound like I'm contradicting myself, but I will. Um, <laughs> On the one hand, I think it's important to acknowledge the inequity of these questions around impact. On the other hand, I think asking what's the evidence is critical, right? <laughs> we know that there are lots and lots of programs out there. How do we know which ones work? And, 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 and so I think it's imperative, I mean, this is the reason why I understand why Eric is holding an event like this. We need to know what is the impact. Now, I want to, that to me, though, is an interesting question. How do we measure impact? And, sure. and, and, but I, there should be an impact. And, and I often tell the, the nonprofits, you need to be able to answer that question. Even without evaluation funds, how do you know that the people you serve benefit? That's right. um, and if you can't answer that question, you're going to be in trouble. So I think it is a legitimate question to ask. I think we just have to be uh, creative in how we go about answering it. I think it's and, about, don't, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, I, Noel, I would say that. What's really important is that we're for something, not just against something. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, a major problem with the, the I would say, the, the, the left-hand side of the education reform sort of space, um, well, major problem with the entire left, um, is that we're opposing things. Um, I'm a huge fan of Diane Ravitch. She's a you know, great writer and thinker. And I really have a hard time with the movement that she's leading because it's mostly oppositional. Um, don't focus on test scores, mm. don't focus on grades, mm -hmm. leave teachers yeah. alone, let them teach, all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. but what are we for? Right. And so <clears throat> maybe we can drown out that, con that, that conversation and we can say, do we improve test scores? Yes, we do improve test scores, but that's not what's important. You know, what's important is that we're focusing on these developmental outcomes or these health outcomes or whatever it is and be, be zealots mm -hmm. for that thing instead of just being like, well, we, we, I, we won't be reduced to a test score and our kids are more than just um, letters and grades. Well, what are they then? Let's talk about the positive rather than just mm -hmm. avoiding the negative. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to Mr. SC. Sorry. Uh, oh, go ahead. But uh, um, also, kindergarten reject now we're talking about it. <laughs> But, um, <laughs> My husband failed kindergarten and he went on to get a Harvard MBA, so you'd be all right. My sister dropped out of junior high and she's now a professor at UC Berkeley. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Figure she's didn't at, go to high school. Figure she's at Berkeley. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, this uh, data just floated. Right. What I want to ask is kind of a sample size and then practical question, too. Um, it, it seems like when we were discussing, I don't know if I'm missing anything, that most of the after school programs are done inside the school walls. Has there been any kind of research or, or partnership that we for us to integrate, integrate more uh, nonprofit organizations? Um, like when I was teaching, most of my athletically inclined kids would be their own Oakland Soldiers AU team, or they, uh, they played football in my league, kind of like the Snoop League down here. We're talking about Oakland, like the Snoop League. Um, or really informally, they, if they really want to stay in sports, um, they you know, could get anywhere. That that's not with the school. That the school does not know about that. The, the school, um, which, you know, so the assessment, evaluation, what they're doing really is done. So there, has there been any kind of partnerships, or what should we do to in, kind of integrate those? I mean, the is an institution in Los Angeles. So so there's there's two distinctions here though. There's there's physical setting, and then there's um, community connections, right? Yeah. So LA's Best is a partnership of the city, the school district, and yeah, the private LA sector, right? Partnership. So we're, we're in, only in LAUSD elementary schools. That, that's our building, but we are a community program. Okay. And um, many of the Beyond the Bell programs are partnerships with organizations like After School All-Stars, Woodcraft Rangers, um, Primetime, World Fit for Kids, so many others, right? Then Beyond the Bell runs, the district runs a lot of their programs on their own as well. Beyond the Bell is a, is a uh, LAUSD division, right? So there's that distinction, and the majority in Los Angeles, they are in school buildings. But then the other distinction is actual community settings, like not just community partnerships, but community settings. 
um, whether it's an arts program or a sports program or whatever it is, yeah. where it's, it's not actually um, restricted by the, the partnership. Because the partnership has great assets. I mean, we would never be able to go to scale serving 25,000 kids without that the, being integrated into the district. But there's serious limitations as to what we can do and how we can operate because we're, we're actually a part of the school. Yeah. Okay, we'll do, can we do one more question? All right, let's say John over here. We both look at paper. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think you're asking the right question because I think, uh, you know, I'm, it, unless we educate the public about what's at stake and why, what matters, then see, I know policy, most politicians follow where they think public, <laughs> the public, where the voters are going to go, right? And so in some ways it's more important, less important to influence Holly Mitchell than the people who vote for Holly Mitchell, right? Um, and not to say that you can't do both, but if we don't spend time thinking about the media strategy, um, then I think we're missing the point altogether. Um, so you're absolutely right. I, you know, I'm thinking, for example, LA Olympics. I was, um, <laughs> do you, do you, are you stealing my thunder? You know, uh, I think that, that part of the campaign has got to be that what's the benefit to LA of hosting the Olympics? Yep. Right? Um, and, and, and not just that we get entertained by the games, but that what's the, you know, the, you know, and not just that we make money, but that there should be some real benefit to the people of LA in terms of infrastructure and in terms of overall health and well-being to the people of LA that really need it. Um, so, you know, I think that some kind of campaign that's educational um, and it's got to be, I mean, I, every time I go on my uh, Wi-Fi in the LAX airport, there's an ad for the Olympics but it doesn't raise any of these questions. So no, but it, it may not on your ad, but <laughs> I was actually, I want to actually end on two things in terms of what we're doing. And it's in the context of, we've got 10 years between now and 2028. And if you guys haven't been paying attention, you know, this mayor has created a conversation, not just in Los Angeles, but, but internationally about universal access to sports. We call it play, to, play for all, he calls it universal access to sports. Um, you know, negotiated that extra four years to bring $160 million to focus on youth sports and is now engaged in conversation in terms of how do we make the biggest impact with that $160 million and how do we use the focus of the Olympic movement that is, you know, in LA's DNA to do those things. I sit on the bid committee and we have a woman by the name of Brent Culp who manages Legacy and the conversation that we're having about Legacy is in the context of youth sports health, sustainability, food deserts. So we're taking a page out of L84 Foundation and the work that we've done and how do we build and scale that legacy? And you know, I'll just leave you with this is one of the things that we've done, I mean with a number of programs that we've done over the last two years, now that we've won the bid and we're changing to an organizing committee, how do we expand that work? So you talk about collaborations. Bob Ross was very, he's also on the board. Bob Ross with the California Endowment says, I want the voice of the kids who don't get heard to actually have a voice and what does legacy mean to them in their community? So of course he calls me and says, Renata, you know, you're organized that thing. And so we got the Annenberg Foundation, I'm, I'm gonna miss all of them, the White Steward, California Endowment, Annenberg, uh, we were in, uh, CCF, the um, 
there was a whole bunch of them. There was like eight foundations. And we engaged 300 young middle and high school students at the California Endowment on a Friday afternoon around what is legacy. There was breakout, we you know, presented to them, there was breakout sessions, and we actually took the feedback that they're telling us about safety in parks and recreation. We need more lights, we need more safety, we want more school-based sports. And so we're now feeding that back into the organizing committee and again taking a page out. So while we've got to raise $2 billion to put the Olympic Games on, how can we also use that momentum and that focus to generate collaboration and generate resources to focus on not just youth sports, but health and wellness, sustainability, and all those other things that we factor in as legacy um, is, is a very real potential. And secondarily to that, what we're doing as a foundation, because we are separate from 2028, and we would have been here either whether or not we won or, won or lost, is we're now looking at how can we use our platform, how can we punch above our weight class to bring some like-minded individuals um, around this conversation so that we can feed into the 2024 bid committee based on you know, the community that we've built up over 33 years, the you know, political uh, relationships that we have, the providers, the foundations, so that we hopefully can, over the next 10 years, look back and say, the legacy that 2028 left on Los Angeles was more than two weeks uh, for you know, this mm -hmm. international sporting event. And that's, that's the commitment that we're making as a foundation. That's the commitment my board has made. And I can guarantee you that uh, the 2028 team, you know, led by the mayor and Casey Wasserman, um, is very committed to that as well. Thank you. Well, I think we are probably just about at our time. So thank you so much to Pedro and to Renata. And thanks, Erica, thank for you. having us.